Hello and welcome to FPL Mate, your best mate for fantasy Premier League content for the 2023-24 season. My name is Dan and today we are going to be going through everything you need to know before the game week 6 deadline. Yes, our final decisions video is here and we've got to cover so much. We've got quotes, injury news and team news from every single club in the Premier League. We're going to be talking about Newcastle players, which midfielders you should buy and sell, uh, which kind of goalkeepers you want to be starting, talking about wild cards. I've got an updated wild card draft for you in this video and we're going to be talking about about a couple of differentials I've got my eye on as well. So a jammed packed video, the only one you need to see from here until the deadline. If you enjoy, drop a like and do subscribe if you're new around here as well. All right, let's get on with the press conferences first and talk about the team news from uh, from around the Premier League. So, yeah, guys, we're probably going to do this every single week now. I've tried to set this up on screen where it's kind of easy to kind of read. It kind of looks kind of pretty. So if you guys do want to see this press conference roundup every week, let me know in the comments. Uh, you guys seem to enjoy it last week. But yeah, let me know and uh, leave a like as well if this is the kind of thing you want to see. And that will tell me that I need to keep doing it. So, yes, Arsenal, first of all. Martinelli will have a late assessment. He has not trained this week. So that is worrying for Martinelli over. Is, might be a player to sell. Party is still out and uh, also Arteta has admitted that neither goalkeeper is safe from rotation. He has admitted he has got a goalkeeper selection headache. So uh, yeah, no good news in terms of Arsenal goalkeepers right now. Both of them are going to be rotation risk as of right now. Uh, we didn't get an Aston Villa press conference, but we do have the news that Ramsey and Moreno are back. They were both in the Europa League team uh, for, well, Europa Conference League team for Aston Villa in that squad. So uh, yeah, they're going to be back hopefully very soon in the Premier League as well. But more Bournemouth, we've got nothing interesting going on. But Brentford, we have got the big news this week. Some of you guys would have seen this already, that Henry is going to be out probably for the entire season. It's quite a bad injury for Henry. Really, really unfortunate stuff because he was looking really, really promising, uh, having a good start to the season. But yeah, he's going to be out for the rest of the season, a must-sell in FPL. Uh, there wasn't an update on me, Damsgaard, or Azure, though, as far as I saw, unless something has come out since I've recorded this video. I couldn't find an update on that one. But let's move on to some more press conferences. So for Brighton, Ferguson is available. He had an illness apparently. So yeah, he's going to be back uh, into the Brighton team. Uh, he was actually back last game week, but then he fell ill during the European game. He had to leave uh, the uh, the zone and uh, hopefully he's going to be back for Sunday. Uh, he is going to be available. It's just an illness, so that's nothing too much to worry about. However, some of these other players are a little bit more risky. So Dunk, Gross and Milner, they're unlikely to be risked because they have actual proper injuries. Uh, Dunk in particular is kind of a, a really risky one. Uh, Gross and Milner also not looking likely to start this game week either. So uh, stay away from Pascal Gross. I know a lot of you guys are buying him because he scored a lot of points last week. Uh, yeah, maybe the time to leave him. Uh, and there is expected to be many changes from the Europa League game. So there's going to be a lot of differences between the Zerbi's team there and now. He said that himself. This isn't me. I uh, speculated. He's literally said, yeah, there's going to be changes uh, between uh, that team. So yeah, go and have a look at the Europa League team for Brighton. It did include players like Estupinian, March. Uh, I think Gross did play in that game as well. Jao Pedro was playing in that game. Mitoma was playing in that game. So yeah, if there's going to be potential rotations in there, that that is something to consider. Maybe some of the players who didn't start might get some game time, like Ferguson or Welbeck or, or uh, Adingra, someone like that. Yeah, might get some game time as well. Uh, Burnley, uh, we've got Foster. He's beginning his three-match suspension. So as the main striker for Burnley, maybe that's good news for Manchester United defenders. And believe me, they need some good news, don't they, Manchester United? And Bayer is going to be fine after suffering cramp last game. For Chelsea, Caicedo is going to have a late assessment. Broja is ready to be back uh, in the squad. Kukurea and Madueke are in full training, but it might be a little bit too early for them to come back into the starting 11. For Crystal Palace, Ayu and Gehi are back in full training as well. That's looking a bit more promising for them, but Lerma and Ahmada are going to be out unfortunately. Uh, uh, Ahmada uh, picking up an injury this week uh, in training, I believe. So, yeah, not looking too good for those two players, those defensive kind of midfielders. Uh, but aside from that, yeah, pretty good news for Crystal Palace to get Ayu and Gehi back. Harrison and Cole Will, uh, Cole Will, Coleman are out uh, for Everton. Uh, for Fulham, Lukic, Tosin uh, and Traore, they're all out, but Robinson could be back. For Liverpool, we didn't have a press conference, but we know from the uh, the Europa League that Trent and Thiago are presumably still out because neither of them were in that squad. And Virgil van Dijk is going to be back following a suspension in the Premier League. So he's going to be back in the team for Liverpool, most likely. For Luton, Barkley is probably going to be unavailable. Very unlikely that he starts, but he should hopefully be back next week for Luton. Uh, other than that, there's no new issues. 
For Man City, we've got Stones and De Bruyne. They're still going to be out. Uh, Bernardo is going to be out as well this week. Kovacic is nearly back, but he's not going to be back this game week. Grealish is training and he is expected to play some minutes this game week. However, not sure if he's going to start necessarily, but maybe Grealish is able to get some minutes off the bench. That might ease the load on some of the uh, Man City attackers and midfielders at the moment. But yeah, basically what this means is players like Foden and Alvarez and obviously Haaland as well. These players are going to be not nailed on but you know really really likely to start because they, there is still a lot of you know absentees here with KDB, Bernardo, Kovacic and Grealish not fully there yet you can expect those guys to start the game there's still a lot of uh, injuries in, in the, particularly in those these really attacking areas for Man City so don't worry too much if you've got those kind of players rotation risk is actually we're not going to be seeing too much Pep Roulette at the moment which is actually uh, you know a blessing really uh, but, but defensively probably still going to be a bit of rotation for Manchester United we've got Shaw and Wan-Bissaka still out Mount and Varane are in full training but uh, we didn't really get any full confirmation about whether they're actually going to be able to play Amrabat is in individual training though so he's probably not going to be playing. But Newcastle, Jolinton and Willock are still out and we are not expecting massive rotation. We're actually expecting how to keep reasonably similar players from the Champions League team into the Premier League team in game week six. For Forrest, Delino's out going to be out for a few weeks. Aurier is still not ready and Bolly is back in training. And the final page, we've got Sheffield United, uh, Bulldog and Ossila still out. McBurney is suspended for one game, so that is going to be this game week. And uh, that's uh, maybe going to be beneficial for the Newcastle defenders if you're going for them. Uh, Egan has trained. He's going to be back in the squad as well. For Tottenham, Perisic, ACL, unfortunately, he's going to be out for a very, very long time. Ben Tanker, Lo Celso, Cessignon and Gil, they are still out as well. Everyone else is available. For West Ham, Bowen has a virus, apparently. He's going to have a late assessment to see if he is going to be available to play. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, that's uh, coming in fairly recently as news. Creswell, uh, he still has a hamstring injury, so uh, maybe we're not going to be seeing a full return for him. Still feeling a little bit tight in his hamstring, unfortunately. So yeah, possibly not back. And for Wolves, no new injuries and uh, no players returning either. So yeah, same as always, business as usual at Wolverhampton Wanderers. So we mentioned Newcastle a couple of times there. Uh, yeah, definitely a team we're targeting right now. They play Sheffield United next, which is a really good fixture. And after that, the fixtures keep coming really, really good all the way. We've got Burnley, we've got West Ham, we've got Crystal Palace, we've got Wolves. Uh, the only bad fixture in this next run is really Arsenal. You've even got Bournemouth in game week 12. So the benefit of Newcastle having had so many horrible fixtures at the start of the season is that they've got amazing ones now and not really too many bad ones to contend with. So we do want to be looking at Newcastle players, particularly in defence, because Newcastle, despite having the horror starts of Horrorville, they uh, somehow have actually kept some really nice defensive numbers and not conceded too many goals. So expected going forward when we've got these easier fixtures, and particularly now we know that there's not going to be too much rotation there in the Newcastle team. Let's go for some defenders, man. Trippier is definitely going to be the one to go for. He's creative, he's on set pieces, and he is a bonus point monster. If you're looking for the big point scorer, it is Trippier. But Trippier is super expensive for a defender, so I understand why some people might look to avoid him. There are some others. Fabian Scher and Botman, go for them. They look good as well at a cheaper price. They're going to have a little bit of aerial threat. Although I should say, even though Fabian Scher has good historical data, you know, attacking data, not really put it together this season so far, but I know we've got a small sample size. Maybe we're going to see Fabian Share pop up with a little bit more in terms of goal involvement very, very soon. But uh, yeah, Share and Botman would be the other defenders to go for. Don't go for Dan Byrne. He has worse numbers than all of these other guys. He is not really any cheaper, really. He's only 4.5 million, so, you know, he's only 0.1 cheaper than Botman, and he's also the most rotation risk there in that Newcastle team as well. Obviously, Newcastle recently purchasing Lewis Hall, who's a left-back, and uh, yeah, might be a little bit of rotation for Burn. He is the least secure and has the worst numbers, and he's not even that much cheaper. Just don't go there. Not worth it at all. Uh, we've got Callum Wilson. Super, super risky forward to go for. It kind of... Some people have got an idea that maybe Wilson is going to play some Premier League games and Isaac play Champions League games. Those are the, the guys who are going to probably rotate the most of everyone. But we, we knew that already. We knew these guys were going to rotate. It's just a case of whether you can get a run of Premier League games starts for Wilson. It is super, super risky. But if you want to take that 
risk, that's fine. And Pope is a decent option in goal, but he's just a little bit expensive. So that's the one uh, downside to him. He is making a couple of saves this season, but that's perhaps because he has had those difficult fixtures. So basically, get some defenders. Uh, we're going to have, we've got, we've got some fixtures coming up where there are teams that are susceptible to conceding from set pieces. So that's going to be nice for all of the top three, Trippier, Cher and Botman. All three of those are going to benefit from playing these teams, not just for clean sheets, but also for potential attacking returns from those set pieces. That's where you want to be putting your money. This is where you need to be investing this week, if possible. If you're not going for Alvarez, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are, are doing that instead. All right, let's talk about midfielders. A lot of people eyeing up some midfield transfers. A lot of people are worried and upset about whatever midfielders they have right now. And I get it. You know, we've had some blanks. We've had some big players get some blanks. Particularly last game week, we saw all kinds of players get blanks. So, you know, we had Fernandez, Rashford, Madison, Son, Foden. All of the big players that we know and love blanking. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's not an ideal situation. I'm not going to lie. But... We've got to remember that we're we're trying to play a little bit, a bit of a long game here, and just because they performed poorly last game week, that doesn't necessarily mean they're a sell. Now, some players are going to be more sellable than others, but it doesn't mean you have to sell all of them, particularly when we consider fixtures. So, looking at this table of data, what I've done is I've picked out all of the most kind of owned popular template midfielders as well as a lot of midfielders that people are thinking about buying this game week and put them all in a table so we could basically compare their data so far this season and how they're getting on. Now I've ordered this by expected points. Now as a standalone metric, it probably doesn't make too sense, but too much sense. But I think expected points is a good kind of uh, sort order because it kind of takes into uh, kind of account everything, like expected goals, shots, bonus points, projected bonus points, and uh, and you know a perspective assists, a perspective clean sheet points as well. I know you know midfielders get one point for a clean sheet. It takes everything, puts it all together, and kind of predicts how many points roughly would have a player with those with that data be expected to get. So it gives you a good idea of how involved the player is in their attacking play, basically. So I do think it's a, a pretty good metric. Uh, we have got Salah at the top, no doubt about it. Salah is the best midfielder in the Premier League in FPL. Like, nobody is arguing that. The problem is his price, which is uh, a different issue entirely. And, uh, you know, with Salah, yes, he's the best player on this list. Clearly, he's the best. But... But transferring him in comes with two problems. One, you're probably going to have to make two transfers in order to do that. You know, you're going to have to take a minus four in order to get salary in. Uh, the second problem is you're probably going to have to sacrifice two good players. Like, it's not a case of trans uh, transferring out one good player. You're losing two good players in order to get Salah in. And you're probably going to have to buy a cheapy guy. Uh, the cheap guy could be someone like Ward Prowse or Neto. Uh, maybe you actually kind of fancy them. You maybe actually like the look of those players, in which case, fair enough. But you are going to have to significantly downgrade uh, one of your uh, midfielders, which if that works for you, fine. But it's for this reason that Salah is not essential unless you're on a wild card. If you're on a wild card, you need to probably be putting some deep thought into getting Salah. If you are, if you are not on a wild card, it's probably going to be difficult. And if you're taking a minus four and if you're removing players you actually quite like for players you don't like just to try and squeeze in Salah, is it worth it? Can you wait until your wild card? I would perhaps wait. So kind of up to you guys. Um, there are different ways of, of doing it though. Uh, after that, we have got Mbumo. So Mbumo would be one player in terms of midfielders who I'll be very keen to bring in. There's not really an excuse not to bring him in. He is cheap. He is very easily accessible. You guys can get him in one transfer. A lot of you guys will already have him, to be fair. But if I'm buying one midfielder this week, it is probably going to be in Boomer with that nice fixture up, up next against Everton. Salah, yes, he is technically a better asset, but he's much harder to bring in using transfers alone. So if you haven't got Mbumo and you have a midfielder in your team right now that you don't like so much, Mbumo would be the player I'd go for. After that, we've got Saka. Some people looking to sell him. I would wait until at least after this Spurs game and Bournemouth game before selling Saka. I think he's still a really very, very good FPL option. We've got Madison. Still really good numbers there from him. Uh, we've got some amazing fixtures coming up after Arsenal. We've got Liverpool, which isn't too bad, and then Luton and Fulham back to back. So Madison, despite his poor score, still would be looking to keep him. Uh, Bruno Fernandes, uh, good numbers, and a Burnley fixture next is pretty good. Sterling's numbers are still good. Rashford's shooting numbers are insane, um, but, you know, he's not quite Quite finishing his dinner recently. Let's see what happens with Rashford. But again, another player I think will do really well against Burnley. So it's kind of difficult. A lot of these players, you know, like Saka, Madison, uh, Bruno, Sterling, Rashford. These guys are probably the players you already have in your team. And they're already kind of 
at the top of the list. The only real players you could really, you know, replace them with and make an improvement on these guys is the likes of Salah and Mbumo. After that, we have got the likes of Diaby and Son. Uh, Son, obviously, I don't know if you want to take into consideration the first three games of the season where he really did do nothing. Uh, it, that's why his numbers are so low in total this season because he was just so, so uh, absent, really. Uh, you know, so periphery in those first few games, but an improvement, obviously, in that Burnley game. Uh, we've got Mittermar, not such great numbers, but great fixture against Bournemouth. We've got Neto there, not so great numbers. Again, uh, overperforming uh, a little bit there on assists, but he has got Luton next. We've got Foden, who actually, to be fair, in general, Foden, based on this, might potentially be a sell. Uh, he has had one less start than a lot of other players on this list, but not really enough to kind of, uh, you know, justify how low he is on this list of kind of popular transfers in and popular template players as well. And Ward Prowse, uh, you know, pretty low to the bottom here. He has played one less games, but his his numbers are down a little bit. He has been overperforming quite a lot, but he, we know what he's like. He's fixture proof. Let's see what he can do in the future. But his numbers are, aren't are great. I just wanted to put that one out there. And we've got Doku there as well. Perhaps a little bit fortunate to uh, to have as many points as he does. But uh, yeah, a little bit risky there in the future, long term. But maybe short-term punt, Doko could be a uh, pretty, pretty interesting, I guess. So yeah, those are basically your midfielders right now. Um, if when you look at it like this. You know, and you look at the numbers. Remember, we've only had five game weeks. This is a five game weeks worth of data. I know people will just look at last game week or maybe just look at the last two game weeks, uh, you know, and, and kind of react based on that or assume form. I don't know. I wouldn't. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I look at these Manchester United midfielders, for example. I see their numbers are actually, you know, pretty decent, really. They're, they're comparable to a lot of the players we would be transferring in for them. And they're about to play Burnley. And I know people say Manchester United, they are playing so badly right now. Yeah, fair enough. But you can have good FPL assets in a, you know, in a bad team. Right? <laughs> that is possible. You know, if Man United are still scoring goals, then it doesn't matter if they concede 10 a game, right? Um, you know, even if you think Manchester United are so bad, they're a mid-table team. Well, yes, maybe they are a mid-table team, but would you say like Brentford are a mid-table team? Um, you're happy to pick Mbumo because it's, it, it is possible for there to be a star player in a team that is maybe not as strong as you would hope they were. But yeah, banter aside, uh, I actually still think a lot of these players, you know, even Sterling's putting up some good numbers. You don't have to sell these if you don't want to. Like, fair enough if you're just sick of it and you just want to react and do something crazy and mess up your team and break the template. I completely understand. I completely understand after a frustrating week last week. But, yeah, just look for his numbers, guys. I don't think there's any strong need to change your midfielders uh, unless you're going for Mbumo. That would be the one exception, I would say. Yeah, make a move for Mbumo if you want to. All right, so we're going to try and do, like, a reverse tier list. Uh, you know, I do the tier list video of, of uh, players to buy. Uh, I don't do one for sells, and a lot of people have suggested that, but I don't think it quite warrants an entire video on its own. So we'll just do a quick flick through here of players I would maybe consider selling and maybe I'd consider keeping. Uh, and these are out of the most popular sold players so far this game week. So yeah, the players I would sell would be Martinelli, Trent, Rodri, Ramsdale, uh, because of that rotation potential, Henry and wan because of their injuries. Those are the players I would be very, very happy to sell. Mostly players who are injured or rotation risk or their defense of midfielders like Rodri, to be fair, and there's just other options to go for right now. Um, in terms of optional sells, none of these players I would be massively happy with uh, selling, but if you've got no other issues, if you've got no players in the, the full-blown sell category, or if you've got no injuries, you've got no massive issues in your team, then these are the kind of players you could consider selling after that. So, yeah, Son is only in here because of his price. If he was, uh, because he's quite expensive, you know, out of the expensive midfielders, I guess you've got Son and Rashford. I would rather keep Rashford this week. Uh, you could always move Rashford back to Son in a couple of game weeks' time. I think that's definitely an option for you. Um, but yeah, that's the only reason Son is an optional sell, is because that might be the only way you can get Salah into your team if you want to make that move. So in that sense, I'd rather sell Son than Rashford right now. And that's why he's in the optional category. Even though in general, I probably wouldn't say he's a, he's a player to sell. But if you want to get Salah, someone's going to be sacrificed. Fernandez, I would rather sell to Rashford as well. Uh, Watkins, Luis Diaz, Foden, Isaac, and Nicholas Jackson, Chilwell, and Jao Pedro. All of these players, I would be comfortable selling. Uh, but uh, they, they're not absolute must-sells, but you know, I'd be comfortable selling them. And there's some players I would actually keep here as well that are being fairly heavily sold. So Rashford definitely would be looking to keep him. Saka, I would want him for the next two game weeks. Madison is not 
expensive enough to justify selling him. You're going to want him back in arguably next game week against Liverpool. Definitely after that for Luton and, uh, and, and Fulham. So I would not be looking to sell Madison. Got to keep him. Darwin I'd like to keep as well. He's been in some good form. I think he'll be back in the Liverpool team. Fingers crossed. Um, and we've got Sterling here as well. I think I would keep him. I really do think he's been putting up some good numbers. And Aston Villa haven't exactly been uh, amazing defensively. So maybe Sterling could be the star man there. Uh, Mittelmeier, obviously, at Stupinian. These are Brighton players. I would be looking to keep them. Uh, Whistler, I would probably keep as well. And Onana, I just don't think it's a priority transfer to, to transfer out Onana. So I'm going to put him in there. It's not like he's rotation risk. You know, there are some other goalkeepers who are in serious trouble. Onana is not one of them. Speaking of goalkeepers, uh, we're going to do a mini goalkeeper uh, bench list. Uh, you guys might remember this from last week. You guys seem to enjoy it, so we'll do it again very quickly. The higher the player is on this list, the more I would prioritise uh, actually playing them this week. So if you've got rotating goalkeepers, say, for example, you have Nick Pope in your team and you've got Turner in your team. And you want to know, Dan, who should I play? Pope or Turner? Well, hopefully this table kind of emphasizes which player I'd rather play. So I'd rather play Pope than Turner. I'd rather play Pope than everyone else on this list, pretty much. <laughs> Literally everyone else on this list. Uh, Fleckard would be the player come, coming closest to, to playing ahead of Pope. Uh, but yeah, if you've got two goalkeepers on this list, play the one that is higher up on this list. In my opinion, that is just what I would do. But maybe you guys will disagree with me on some of them. Uh, but yeah, even, you know, we've got Onana here, for example. Like I kind of said, not sure I'd sell him because actually he's actually probably a slightly better option than a lot of the other goalkeepers that you guys will have like Ramsdale, Vicario um, Pickford, Ariola, and Turner I would still rather play Onana despite everything above some of those guys because uh, Burnley is not such a bad fixture particularly with Foster missing Right, I wanted to um, throw this on screen uh, just to hold myself accountable and just to, uh, you know, just emphasize a point really. This is my Game Week 1 FPL team and this is my score if I didn't make a single change. It's 20 points more than I have right now. 308 points, that's 20 more points than I currently have if I didn't make a single transfer all season. So if I didn't make any transfers, if I forgot my password to my team, I would have 308 points and two transfers in the bank ready to go for the following game week. And that shows patience can be key. It can be an edge. It is something that is missing a lot from FPL at the moment. Uh, early season, we see it every year. People panic at the smallest thing. They transfer in players that scored well the last week and they transfer out players that, you know, blank for one game week. You know, people panic. People go crazy. And what we can kind of see here is that in game week one, the players that I picked, the players I have confidence in, the players I researched all summer, actually... They didn't do so bad. It's not the perfect team, but for a, to, for a team to go in to the to this season, five game weeks in, and score three, 308 points with no transfers, that's not really too bad. Is it? Is it? Is it a fairly decent start, all things considered. And it's a better start than I actually did have. So, yeah, I think that is just maybe a sign that sometimes we maybe need to take a step back, stop getting overexcited, try and be a little bit more patient, have a little bit more faith in the players that we picked. It could make the difference rather than just panicking all the time at the slightest haul, at the slightest blank, everything going crazy, price changes, whatever. Maybe patience is key. So just, you know, it, it, could, it could help. It will certainly help me a little bit, I think. And now speaking of being patient, is it time to wildcard? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm going to throw this graphic on the screen again. We, I, I put this in last week's video, to be fair, but I'll just flash it again quickly. Uh, it'll be the only flashing I do today. Uh, but yeah, just about the best time to wildcard. Game week 9 and 10 look like really good weeks to wildcard. Game week 19 it does as well. Feel free to pause this if you want to read it in full. Uh, but game week 3, uh, no, option 3, sorry, I've put here, uh, is to use it as a reaction when your team looks really bad. And you might be saying that that is right now. Your team looks really bad right now and you want to use it right now. And fair enough. And if you are... This is what I would do. So here is my wild card draft. This is what I would do if I was on a wild card right now. Of course, this again is from Fantasy Football Hub. All of the uh, kind of data and graphs you've seen in this video are from using our Fantasy Football Hub data. So uh, yeah, link in the description if you want to go check that out. They've got a free trial going right now. Uh, but yeah, this is the My Team tool. And uh, yeah, it's a 96% rated team by the AI. We're 0.2 million over budget. But I imagine most of you guys will have a little bit of money in the bank there. Maybe you can downgrade Ariola possibly to save some money. Um, but yeah... Uh, 
Uh, we've got Flecken in goal, Cher and Botman, double Newcastle defence there. I couldn't fit in Trippier into this team. I, I don't think it's possible to have a wildcard team with Salah and Trippier without basically making the rest look really bad. I've already got, you know, like no Saka in this team, which I'm worried about. Um, we've got Cash there in defence as well. Like I said, we have got Salah. Rashford, I would definitely be looking to keep for Burnley. And Bumo, no excuse to not have him. Madison, just to save you some transfers going into game week seven or eight. But I mean, maybe you would prefer to have uh, the likes of Saka in here, but Saka is quite a lot more expensive. So... I don't know, it's going to be difficult to afford. I put Diaby in here because I do think it is important if you're wildcarding now to get ahead of the Aston Villa fixtures that are going to about to become really, really good. We do need to go in on some Aston Villa players. So uh, yeah, maybe doing that slightly earlier might be the play if you're on a wildcard because game week 9 and 10 wildcarders, they're going to be bringing in Aston Villa players there as well. And up front, we've got Erling Haaland and Alvarez, and I don't think anyone will argue with that one. Bench of Ariola, Archer, Cabore, who's actually looking a little bit dangerous in those attacking positions, so it could be good for the double game week. And Adogi there as well, so... There you go, guys. That is uh, the uh, Game Week 6 wildcard draft I've got right now. Let me know what you think about it or if there's any changes you might make to it. But, uh, yeah, it's, of course, it's missing a couple of players. It's not perfect. This is the problem with having Salah. It is, you know, you, you lose one thing, but you gain another thing. You know, so it's a balancing act. And you've got to figure out what's more important to you. Having Salah or having the likes of, you know, Saka or, and, you know, a Son or, or a Fernandes. But to be fair, not a lot of people like <laughs> Son and Fernandes right now. So you can understand why they might prefer Salah. And finally, guys, I am going to try and claw back a little bit of reputation by uh, kind of go, uh, predicting some Game Week 6 deferentials because um, I actually did this a couple of weeks ago but forgot to do it in a subsequent one of these uh, final decisions video and we absolutely nailed it. I, and I look back at the video and the three players, I did one in each position and, I, and this was ahead of Game Week 3, I said go for Julian Alvarez. He's done amazingly. I said go for Raheem Sterling as a differential. He scored 20 points that game week. Fair enough, he's been in the mud since then. But the game week before, the, the game week where I predicted he would do well, he scored 20 points, which has obviously worked out really well as a prediction. And even my defender differential, I suggested, was Udogi. So obviously, he's obviously been a hype player now. So we've got Sterling, who scored 20 points in that game week. And we've got uh, Alvarez and Udogi, who are pretty much template players now that everyone wants in their team. So those predictions went really well. So I thought, okay, Let's try and do that again. Let's try and pick out some low ownership players that I think might really, really make a difference in the upcoming game weeks. And this is what I come up with. Well, Ferguson against, uh, uh, yeah, we've got him against Bournemouth. That's a pretty decent fixture for him. So, uh, yeah, if he starts, we know his ceiling is super, super high. Like, really, really high. He's, he's one of those players that can score multiple goals uh, in games. Anyone who plays as a striker for Brighton is pretty much guaranteed goals. It's just a case of trying to figure out who is going to be playing as the striker for Brighton. But Ferguson definitely has the talent to do it, particularly in these uh, fixtures like this, coming back from his illness. Neto plays against Luton. Uh, he's a very much a differential midfielder right now at 1.7% ownership. And uh, with Luton tax... You know, anyone can score some good points. But Neto does seem to be the pick of the bunch for Wolves. He's looking the most dangerous. Very, very creative there. And, uh, yeah, could get some points. And Fabian Scher, high risk, high reward, as we kind of spoke about before. He's, uh, you know, got, you know, typically gets really good attacking numbers. And he's playing against some teams really poor from set pieces. If Trippier is whipping in some corners, Fabian Scher is possibly going to be the main player attacking them in the box from those corners. And might actually end up scoring a goal over the next couple of game weeks. So another player... High risk, high reward, but another differential player that might make that difference in your team. So, yeah, if we're going for differentials this week, these would be the three that I like the most. And I'll try and do this every week, kind of which differentials are kind of fancy that I think will become big things in the near future. Because I got it right once. That's not to say I'm going to get it right again. But, I don't know, it's, it's, some, it's a little fun game to play on, on the side. And, and, you know, I'm going to start trying to go for some differentials as well. So, I'm enjoying doing the research to try and figure out who might do well. So guys, ultra long video today. I do apologize for that. Uh, if you do enjoy this one, please do drop a like. It really, really does help out. A lot of work goes into making these videos to give you that roundup, everything you need to know before the uh, game week deadline. Uh, do subscribe if you haven't done already. We are going to be streaming uh, for the deadline, of course, as we always do. So looking forward to seeing a few of you guys in the deadline stream where we'll be answering all your questions. And if you've got any other questions, guys, drop them in the comments. I'll try and answer as many as I can. So comments in the section. Uh, comments in the section? Uh, yeah, comments in the 
section guys and I'll try and answer some but something like that thank you so much for watching once again don't forget to check out this video I'm sure it's very very good and something like that. thank you so much for watching once again and I will see you later mates bye bye